Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, the Mobile World Congress has opened in Barcelona, where Huawei has unveiled the first 5G chip. Will the U.S. and China race to commercialize 5G internet? And on today's edition of our series, Women on Top, I speak with Tan Yuan Yuan, widely considered as the greatest ever Chinese ballerina. I find out the steps it took to become a ballet queen. Let's begin our program in Barcelona. The world's biggest mobile tech gathering opened its door in the city with more than 2,000 companies jostling for attention for consumers. 5G networks and artificial intelligence are the main focus for this year's Mobile World Congress. Take a look at this. Faster and faster, 5G can dramatically increase data transmission speed. Another benefit is its low latency. The combination of speed and the quicker response times may unlock the full capabilities of other hot trends in technology. It's expected to give a boost to artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, drones, virtual reality, and the wider Internet of Things. And the key topics at this year's Mobile World Congress are really around 5G and artificial intelligence, and how the two coming together, you know, the 5G networks, really creating a platform that allows uh, artificial intelligence to thrive. You know, the, the low latency, the connectivity, putting uh, remote computing into the cloud that can seamlessly and really quickly interact with perhaps dumb machines like robots on the ground. Thousands of members of mobile companies, startups and tech-savvy visitors enjoyed their tours throughout the exhibition. As part of the convention, Chinese developments in 5G networks, the next generation of wireless technology, took center stage at MWC. Huawei, the tech giant from China, launched a new laptop and a set of tablets. And Huawei also revealed its next stage of the 5G journey with the announcement of its first 5G-ready modem. Huawei focused on the uh, product and the solution. We provide a product and a solution to our customers that is offline. Uh, anyway, I think uh, for the mobile communication, it is a whole ecosystem. I do believe that not only Huawei, also, but also Ericsson and Nokia, they will also provide such kind of equipment. Last week, China's National Development and Reform Commission also released plans for 5G network construction projects in 2018. The 5G networks will be built in at least five cities to form continuous coverage. New technologies are entering a high-speed development phase worldwide, and China is up to speed. For more on this year's Mobile World Congress and the 5G technology coming your way, we are joining our Beijing studio. Andy Mock, who is the founder of Red Pagoda Resources, provides professional services for startups in China. Welcome. Joining us also in Hong Kong, Edison Lee, head of telecoms, telecom equipment and power research at Jefferies Hong Kong Limited. In New York, we have Professor Max Wolf, professor of economics from New School University. I want to welcome to the three of you. And may I start with you, Mr. Mark. Huawei is pushing hard this year about the 5G technology, likely to produce 5G phone before the end of the year. So what are we talking about here when it comes to 5G development here in China? Well, I think it's a very exciting time for Huawei and for China, not just because Huawei has announced a 5G phone, which is a consumer device, but I think we also need to recognize that Huawei is the largest telecommunications equipment company in the world, and they can play, they conduct R&D in every part of the 5G value chain. Mm. So I think that they're very well positioned uh, to play a leadership role globally, well, in China and globally, in the coming 5G revolution. Mm, that is in China, of course. Huawei, together with some of the others, are also trying to play that big role there. But not only China, Mr. Li, since you're doing research about the telecommunication uh, field, let me ask you, Japan, South Korea, United States, and China, four leading players, apparently, in the world about 5G technology, how are we going to do the comparison? 
I think that uh, these countries are definitely at the forefront of trying to roll out 5G services as soon as possible. However, I think China is different from the rest in the sense that China will not only be rolling out the service, building the network, but they will also have uh, among the biggest companies that will be making the equipment, not only for the network, but also for the handsets. Mm -hmm. So I believe that China will be the only country in the world that will be both making the equipment uh, and also be rolling out the surface very aggressively, uh, being among the first in the world. Mm. But we have to say, by the year 2020, it's very likely half of the population using 5G services have access to it will be Chinese. However, there will be a big chunk of Americans as well, according to the latest statistics. So let's go to Professor Wolf about the U.S. development. Uh, how open is it? Yeah, so I think we're going to be a little behind where we probably should be here in the U.S., and we're probably about two years from having major coverage from our large incumbent wireless players. That has a lot to do with them being fairly risk-averse and trying to figure out how to sustain some of the relatively more expensive data and voice packages around the world for their clients and not feeling that much pressure given how consolidated the industry is. So I think we will not be first to the market, but we'll be big in the market. And, and I would remind everyone that we'll talk about smartphones all the time, and it's Mobile World Congress, it makes sense, but the Internet of Things hangs in the balance too, and when 5G is 100 times the speed of 4G, it has implications for self-driving cars and smart devices far and beyond just a smartphone. Oh my God, you are talking about something really fascinating. 5G certainly is going to be very different from 4G and certainly a big notch up, shall we say. Download a high definition movie, five seconds on your smartphone, creating virtual reality videos at any moment. That's what we are talking about. Having driverless cars, very unlikely they're having any pumping into each other accidents. That's what we are talking about. And we are talking about the huge drones that is likely to take, you know, the, a big chunk of our lives that we could ever imagine. Uh, that is the fascinating things about it, Mr. Mark. But there's another side of it, that is the competition, which all of you have been talking about. How dirty now is this competition, both in terms of politics and in terms of market chunk? Well, I think it is very, very competitive because every company, every country sees the enormous economic potential uh, that 5G offers. Mm. I think that being said, as our other guests also mentioned, I think that China is very well positioned to lead and the U.S. for structural reasons uh, might be playing a little bit of catch up. Countries like South Korea and Japan and companies there as well, the Samsungs, the other companies, mm. might not have the same structural environment that will allow them to accelerate the development and the commercialization of many of these end-to-end really? uh, -end uh, applications. Really? I have to question yeah. you about your answer because in Pyeongchang, for example, during the Winter Olympic Games, you see South Korea trying to demonstrate the latest version they have got when it comes to 5G technologies, mm -hmm. both hardware and software. Yeah. In the arena, for example, mm -hmm. 100 cameras catching the moment. If you have the 5G phone, you got the virtual reality replay of any moment over there. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And South Korea is small, relatively speaking, when mm -hmm. it comes to geography compared to China. Yes. So is Japan. So it's much easier for these two countries to get the 5G network all played out throughout the country than China. Well, I think that's a good point, Tianwei, but these are pilot projects and they are hmm. more one-off. They're also consumer-facing. And as uh, our guest also in the U.S. said, the real action is in the Internet of Things. Mm. So it's vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, vehicle-to-infrastructure communications. It's uh, telemedicine, the ability to do remote surgery. These are the more enterprise-facing ones that I think China has the system to develop and roll these things out mm. in a mainstream way at scale. And it that is the real... Uh, that is a real opportunity over yeah. there, but will the others also catch the real opportunity? And can that be shared? Uh, Professor Wolf, we understand Huawei, for example, let's just throw in that example. With Verizon, with AT&T, it had some difficulties. Both companies withdrew from an earlier agreement for cooperation. So we do not know exactly what exactly is the reason for real, but 
what does it say about future cooperation possibilities among all when it comes to 5G? Professor Wolf. Yes, so, so, it's, so it's a great point. I mean, look, there's two 5G markets that everyone is going to struggle for, whether those are some of the Nordic European countries that have done some interesting stuff too, uh, or South Korea, Japan, China, U.S., which is both the internal market, of course, particularly in the United States and China, where it's very large, but also the export market, where the rest of the world will eventually buy these technologies, and it's a multi-billion or $100 billion question from whom. And I think part of the <laughs> irony of the moment is the true Internet of Things and 5G requires global cooperation and sourcing across boundaries, mm. both inside firms and what's called intra-firm trade and international trade, and the nasty sort of pre-trade war type rhetoric we've started to see uh, from, some, from some folks here in Washington, D.C. particularly, is not good for that and will slow down the 5G arrival, particularly in those places that need a lot of component parts imported. And on that list of folks who will need the, imp the international cooperation to build a proper network is, of course, us here in the U.S. Mm. But Mr. Lee, I mean, when it comes to telecommunication issues, it has to be global because you want to, when you travel, you want to have your access to this network all the time. You don't want to get it cut out once you step out of your country, which is people usually do now these days, they travel a lot. So, Mr. Lee, how do you see this quite divided kingdoms so far? Well, I think it is very important to recognize that 5G will be a single global standard. I think in cellular communications, we have never had a single global standard before. So we started from three, uh, 2G, which had uh, three standards, and then going into 3G, and there were still three standards, and then it converged it into two standards in 4G, and right now going into 5G, we will have a truly single global standard, which means that consumers around the world will use the same handsets, and they can actually roam in uh, any countries that they are traveling to, and I think this will also create a very big scale for the industry, which ho hopefully is going to help lower the cost of wait, the network equipment and wait, the handsets wait, wait, wait. and the devices. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, I have to ask you about that. You said it is likely to be a unified standard. We're not sure about that because there's no standard yet when it comes to unified, when it comes to 5G. It's only possible that next year the discussion might come to a successful end, but we do not know. You see also very different stages of development, China, Japan, South Korea, and the United States, vis-a-vis, -vis, let's just say, Europe and some of the other continents. So whether we're going to have a standard global one and only one, we don't know yet, Mr. Lee. Well, I am pretty sure that we are going to have one single global standard because okay. the standard has been developed by a global organization which is called 3GPP, which yes. is also part of the ITU. So it is a United Nations organization which has been responsible for developing the 3G standard, the 4G standard, and in fact it is a global industry alliance where every major equipment makers and operators around the mm. world have been participating in this process. So China has been very actively participating in the process back in uh, 2012. So yes, it has been like a five, six year uh, period already uh, that uh, a lot of work from uh, various parts of the world and various operators mm. and equipment makers have contributed to try to achieve the performance requirements set uh, by this group uh, and uh, also contribute to uh, various solutions. So mm -hmm. that's why I think 5G is such a great opportunity, not only because of the features and the capabilities, but because of the fact that this will be a truly global, single global standard uh, that we will have, s that we will be seeing for the first time in cellular communications. Right, just for the reference of our audience, ITU stands for International Telecommunication Union. That is an organization, right, under the United Nations umbrella. Yep. And that's why we trust it to create the standard of 5G for global use. Having said that, though, we witnessed already on this, our screen earlier some of this smart hardware, in a way. The hardwares are getting ever smarter. That's what the, those makers are promising us. But Professor Wolf, without the network improvements, such as 5G, can we really make that big step forward, Professor Wolf? 
not in a way that most people can appreciate or enjoy. So if you think of the new generation of chips, and we've seen some interesting AI-capable uh, chipsets coming out recently from the likes of Google and Huawei and other groups around the world, uh, Apple as well, Samsung mm -hmm. pushing the envelope, but mostly what, what, may, what is smart now, where the computing power resides, is actually in the cloud. And in the decentralized moment where a lot of computing power and storage is distributed, our ability to access literally our memories and our computer brains are only as good as the network because we're dialing in and dialing down and downloading from those centralized storage facilities and brains. So it's a little bit like asking how good your hands are if your heart or your head doesn't work, right? It's, it's a body, it's integrated, and the nervous system that signals the different pieces of the body is increasingly these networks. And if the network is not good, then obviously the strength of the hands don't matter much without the brain to, to coordinate. Exactly. Having said that, though, uh, Mr. Mock, you know, we have debates about this. And that debate has become increasingly stronger, which is because of the privacy issue, of the legal issue, labor issue, all related to the improvements of our technologies and the availability of AI, for example. But when it comes to 5G, a new set of issues will also arise as a result. When you have new technology, you have new issues. So, Mr. Mark, without handling the earlier set of issues well yet, can we handle what 5G would bring to us, Mr. Mock? Well, I think you're absolutely right, Tianwei, in that it's not just technology, and especially with 5G, there's a lot of attention paid to the speed of this new standard, but it's actually also latency, power usage, because when we think about IoT, it means that anything that can be connected to the Internet will be connected. And I'll use healthcare as a quick example here. Uh -huh. So in telemedicine, it's not just about do we have the right technology? What are the right policies in place to protect patient privacy, uh, to prevent hacking? Uh, what about payment systems for insurance? If you're doing a remote surgery, how is that handled? So this is where, again, I think China is uniquely well positioned to develop a complete mature set of applications that includes not just the technology, the hardware, the policies, mm. the regulations, everything that goes around it to actually make 5G improve the lives of people and improve the efficiency and the profitability of businesses all around the world. Right, but Mr. Lee, it's not just about efficiency. It's not just about prof profitability, as Mr. Mark just mentioned. It's also our lives, about many other things. Our rights, our life, our future. These are all complicated issues that cannot be measured by money, cannot be measured by time. So, Mr. Lee, what about the other factors? Do you think 5G will bring us new thinking about them? I think definitely that will be the case. Um, 5G will be able to bring in new services, will be able to bring in um, new capabilities that were previously not available. I think when we thought about uh, the migration from 2G to 3G, that actually made data transmission possible. And I think that during the 2G era, we would never have thought what could be doable when we had mobile data uh, and before we had smartphone we would also be we would also not be able to think about what we could do with our phone uh, with this little device that we spend so much time on every day right now so I think when 5G is going to come it's going to change everybody's life it's going to change the business model of every company and it's going to change the way that the government is going to manage different industries as well so that's why I think there are a lot of services and a lot of capabilities that we may not be able to think about right now but when the technology is there then there will be software developers there mm -hmm. will be companies there will be entrepreneurs that will be able to think about uh, how to develop uh, new services to take advantage of that technological capabilities. Right. Hopefully the individuals as well, private citizens. Professor Wolf, before we go, we only have one minute and a half left. Help us understand what kind of picture are we looking at with the help of 5G getting access? We are getting access to it. Yeah, so I think you bring up a very good point, which is these are all tools, and tools are nested in a society with rules and politics and culture and economics and environmental issues, and those don't go away just because we have 5G. I would highlight three areas that I think will be profound. 
I think surveillance technologies are getting smarter and faster, and that what people once did, machines can do vis-a-vis -vis surveillance, and that's going to make some uncomfortable but important conversations about keeping us safe versus keeping our privacy. Mm -hmm. Those will not go away. They'll probably get more pronounced. I think we're also going to see a next generation of automation, which is going to threaten certain kinds of employment, which are going to have real ramifications, and we're also going to see the ability to monitor the international flow of goods, and that's going to affect tax collection and the informal economies around the world, and in many of these more developed states, right. the United States, China, that we've been talking about, that's not a huge industry, but in some countries it's more than half of GDP. So I think there's going to be some big changes coming, and I think we are going to have to work those out separate and apart from the technology. A lot to expect, and yet a lot of issues are coming as a result of that too. Thank you so much, the three of you, helping us to unveil the secret world of 5G. Andy Mock, Edison Lee, Max Wolf, really appreciate you gentlemen for being with us. Thank you so much. Stay with us here on World Insights, still to come on our program. On today's edition of our series, Women on Top, I speak with world-renowned ballerina, Tan Yuan Yuan. We find out how a coin toss by her parents altered her life trajectory. Y'all watching World Inside. This week we bring our special series of interviews, Women on Top. Today's episode follows Tan Yuan Yuan, born in Shanghai and admitted to Shanghai Ballet Dance School at the age of 11. Tan is a legend of the ballet world. She is the only Asian chief executive of the San Francisco Ballet and one of its most prominent lead actors in the dance troupe. She won the Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Dance Magazine and was honored the Asian heroine on the cover of Times at the age of 26. A legend of the ballet world, from a talented girl to a ballet queen, Tan Yuan Yuan spent decades earning international awards and made the world behold this exquisite oriental face. At the age of 11, Tan Yuan Yuan was admitted to the Shanghai Ballet Dance School. While her father disapproved of her choice, her mother encouraged her to pursue her talent. So, they toss a coin to decide her fate. The result was yes. But Tan began to learn dancing nearly a year later than her peers. This prompted self-doubt to the point she thought she was an ugly duckling. The ugly duckling eventually became a white swan. Through her hard work, at the age of 14, Tan won the first international prize in Finland, and one year later, she won the gold medal at the fifth international ballet competition in Paris. When most 18-year-old girls are still unaware of their true calling, Tan Yuan Yuan, who studied at the Ballet Academy of Dance in Stuttgart, Germany, had already received the signing invitation from the San Francisco Ballet. In only three years, Tan Yuan Yuan jumped from the solo dancer to the principal dancer. For nearly 30 years, she used her youth to perform almost all of the classic ballets. She is a well-deserved ballet queen. Even though she is 40 years old, she is still 100% full of passion on stage. She is not only a dancer, but also an international artist who made contributions to cultural exchange and exposed the world to Chinese ballet. Twenty years on the stage. For anyone doing anything for 20 years, it's respectful. Not to mention ballet dancing. Um, at the beginning, I don't think it's possible because <laughs> usually we, as a ballet dancer, due to the injuries and then like a uh, workload, we have a, a lot of unexpected things happen in life as well. Um, so uh, sometimes we retire at the age of 30, 35. I extend my career by pretty far as a dancer. Is it possible still to challenge always yourself? Um, for me, 
sometimes it's very tiring and I want to get some rest mm -hmm. or just doing a little bit less. But somehow when I showed up in the studio and I start practice and I can't go backwards, I have to just go forward. All the way? All the way. And on stage I put 120, not 100. Sometimes I, I just feel, why are you doing this to yeah, yourself? Exactly. And, but it just happens naturally. Even though I want to hold back to do a little bit less, then it's impossible for me to do so because I really get used to the intensity and 120 yeah. for over 22 years. I remember in an interview you were saying, well, it's been 20 years. I feel so lucky that my body is still responding to me. On a daily basis, um, at the beginning, um, when I wake up, I just check where it's felt pain, and then sometimes it got like a very stiff joint yes. and a sore neck, what sore do you muscles. Do with this? Well, um, I just go to the studio and warm up, take a very hot shower to let the, the muscle relax a little bit, and uh, I do some kind of uh, you know, uh, exercise to warm up the muscles and the joint. And, uh, but you, know, you sometimes have to dance through the pain. When you're young, recovery time is shorter. Short. But when you're getting older and then have more intensive um, workload, then you probably recover much, much slower. slower than when you're young. So actually, it's always a mixture both pleasure it's something that you really like you really yeah. enjoy and you shine in it and also pain at the same time always a mixture it's always a mixture and it's beautiful suffering the competition just to think about it on the ballet stage mm -hmm. is fierceful yes. you've been there 22 years every year there are new dancers very talented very physically challenging could be on the stage and every time they could be coming with an extra portion of different cultures. So how do you look at that situation? And at the same time, how do you grow mm -hmm. all the way, even though you are extremely successful already? Uh, when I was young, I faced the same and thing. And you're still young, my dear. Let me tell you about this. <laughs> well, yeah. When I'm younger, <laughs> um, when I first time joined the company, I was the youngest solo of the ch company, San Francisco Ballet Company history. How old were you then? I was uh, s a 17 wow. and 17 and a half. And I got promoted when I was 19, mm -hmm. become the youngest uh, Chinese ballerina ever happened, like in, in the history of ballet world, is the youngest principal. Indeed. Yes. So that load of jealousy is amazing. I was there I w without speak any English and I had to face that. So at the beginning I was very upset and I was like why they treat me like this? Mm -hmm. And then I realized this is like the, the, the real world. It's not part of the game. The part of the game. If you're good but just believe yourself mm -hmm. and then I called I called my parents and I was like, Oh my god, I don't I wanna come back because it is really difficult for me to be here. At the but time your parents were in Shanghai? Yeah, it was in still in Shanghai. In, in, in Shanghai, yeah. But my mom told me just like do your to do the best that you can and then everything else will be solved. Mm -hmm. So I did it what she said, it, yeah. it works. So I, I just like really just home and the studio yeah. stage back home. So that's my routine. And then that's for five years. I don't really have a lot of friends, especially in the company, but uh, I think they noticed my talent. And also, of course, the director gave me a lot of uh, uh, opportunities. So I conquered every single one. Mm -hmm. that's, um, I showed it to them. And showed on stage. That's the, the most, in Chinese say, new, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the most, you know, it worked out. Um, so, I think I believe in my ability mm. and with all the competition and I see I've been through and I see now all the young dancers wanted to become a star. Uh, it will take time but when on this uh, very rocky road you have to be mentally strong. Right. You do have to um, not just like few performances but all the way from the studio. Even when you change your clothes um, 
in the dressing room, you have big mindset. Okay, this is a new start. It's kind of like meditation at the beginning. So like, okay, I changed this outfit. I am a ballerina now, and I needed to work uh, the best that I can. Um, every single step, every single minute, make it very important. How did you manage to find your style? You know, I'm sure through a lot of hard work, people get better technically. Mm -hmm. But the style thing and the spirit mm -hmm. of a dance artist is very hard to find. How did you, when was the moment for you to realize, huh, that's probably it? I think the first feelings when I was 15 in Finland, healthy singing. Uh, competition. At that time I was only 15 and uh, that was the first experience that I was traveling abroad, like foreign country and I see a lot of foreign dancers and I was like wow ballet can be like this because when I was in the school I was very shallow just uh, to uh, do what the teacher tell me to do. Only the classics, right? Only the classics. Mm -hmm. A little bit of contemporary, but I wouldn't say it's contemporary, just like not wearing tutus. I see. <laughs> so it's not like a really like use your body to tell the story. I'm just like a copycat to copy what is right. They, I think it's the right thing to do, or the teacher thinks it's the right thing for me to mm -hmm. do. So I don't have a personality when I'm dancing. Then I saw a lot of uh, uh, dancers are older than me and then I was like wow there's something really interesting mm -hmm. why I cannot do this why what they are thinking when they're dancing so I was just like very um, very uh, curious about it then I won the silver medal at the first competition I was 15 I was like oh okay that's good but when I was doing the performance I already finished the competition just a performance. Then I relaxed. I was like, oh, maybe I can just like do a little bit softer here and there and just listen to the music. That moment, I think, opened my mind. After that, here After we that, go. Like you and you and you and <laughs> After that, I just like really still training with the teacher and in the school. Then I think uh, really opened my eyes is in when I was in Germany studying and I was in San Francisco because I see a lot of things like different things that I did not learn in the school. So seeing it, yeah. going there, yeah. experience it does help tremendously. Oh, I have to say if I uh, didn't do that, I won't be dancing like that way. And you were saying earlier in another interview that when you are doing your characters on the mm -hmm. stage, you know that you have become them, mm -hmm. but you are not imitating them. Yes. How is that possible? I mean, as we women grow, mm -hmm. we seem to be much more enriched by our lives and experiences. And I guess for dance artists like you, mm -hmm. it's particularly true. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? Can you help us to understand Put that? yourself into this role and then just think how this character are thinking. For example, I did this like amazing piece called The Little Mermaid. Hans Christian himself is the mermaid mm -hmm. because he has so much pain in him. And that's why he wrote in the book saying that she can't, she, her voice is is taken away because that's what she, she have now is the human leg instead of a beautiful tail. So she cannot speak. It's like a lot of things that Hans Christian Anderson cannot tell the world that he's gay, that he's in love with the young master. Mm -hmm. So that's why he wrote this story that Little Mermaid is him. So what if I'm him in a Little Mermaid? Mm -hmm. How I feel, like the pain you cannot express but the pain is in here so what your body language should do it's not like this this is happy and you have to be like really tight and then uh, it's not angry but suffering so in this way that your body language completely changed and then body cannot talk so that's only the uh, that's our tool and it's a very powerful tool exactly to tell the story with the music itself.
I wish Hans Christian Anderson got the chance to be able to see your your performance. Thank I'm you. sure he will be dazzled. The other hand, Giselle. Yeah. Very dramatic story. Very dramatic. And personality goes ups and down with the story. Well, uh, I have to say, Giselle also uh, one of it's my favorite. It's a favorites. lot of work. Yes, uh, one of my favorite uh, role. It's not only because the technically it's very difficult. You have to be precisely with tip. Uh, difficult variations, mm -hmm. solos, and then part of this. But uh, for me, uh, to create Giselle, um, every year that I'm, when I get older, it's more interesting because... Tell me about it. Uh, it's not so difficult to become innocent like a oh. country girl, right? But the difficult is transition when she find out that she got cheated mm -hmm. from the Prince Albert, and then she go get, get mad. And she have already had very uh, heart condition, mm -hmm. like in the beginning. But how she felt it, and she felt betrayed, and how angry she is, and how upset she is, and then triggers the madness, and then she go there's a scene, it's mad scene. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting because you only have this certain music, only very little time mm -hmm. to express her pain, and then how to say it's uh, this is like end of the world That's right. for a young girl and how she is really heartbroken but the, at the end she still reach out f to him because she still loves him deeply and that uh, transformation that stage transform by stage yeah. yes yes so it's very detailed but mm -hmm. you have to really do a lot of behind scene like work on your own mm -hmm. and then to be in the studio alone to know a little even to to get to the details of little fingers, how your hands gesture, like you, 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 if you cover the mouth like this, it's not like so you have to cover the mouth a little bit, like you can see that it's a little bit of things that make a huge difference. Huge though. difference. Yeah. Were you always in the studio thinking about those details by yourself? Yeah. I feel more comfortable instead of people telling me to do so. Mm. Or the coach can be like walking and say, oh, this is nice, but maybe if you do a little bit of this, it will look better. Mm -hmm. So I will take it, the advice and then work on that. I was like, okay, this will work. Or every time I, uh, I do things slightly different. Right. So that's why my Giselle, uh, like I think two years ago in the, uh, the uh, National Performing Arts Center, uh, that was, it was a, a huge, medical. huge success. I, I think it was uh, a magical I have to say that probably my best Giselle ever. That day I was just open myself and I just let things happen. I felt I'm really light as a feather and there's no weight mm -hmm. on my on my shoes. I just like flying across stage. So I think this feelings you really can't happen all the time. If there's once and that's already a miracle. And I'm very glad that the miracle happened here in Beijing. It's already a blessing, isn't it? And still today, people are talking about that performance in Yuan Yuan. Really? really? Yes, okay. they are. And they were remembering very well the 20th anniversary, both of the San Francisco Ballet yes. and also your performance in China. People here are just extremely proud of this Chinese ballerina called Yuan Yuan, yes. who eventually becomes such a world-renowned, you know, dance artist. But there are many other Chinese girls that are learning ballet mm -hmm. or try to be on the international stage mm -hmm. in different art forms. Yes. Do you have some advice for them? I mean, your days are much more difficult mm -hmm. because you've never seen the outside world. Mm -hmm. But of course, today's China is different. But I guess there's something that has to be consistent mm -hmm. and would be helpful to them. I feel I was not really polluted by outside the world. I'm That's kind of like a word. I kind of just like a be myself. I'm very happy to just stay home doing like, you know, watch a movie, relax my body and the next day think about oh what I should work on for the programs and then steps. Mm. And for a dancer you have to take care of yourself. You cannot go out clubbing party too much because it will affect your performance or your training. Be on the top. As a dancer or artist, you're like a, a monk. You know, life is short, as they always say. Uh, particularly when you are extremely good in your profession. But at the same time, be able to relax yourself, to make it open, 
it's another thing. So that's a balance that I was thinking about every day, but I guess for you will be even more. Yes, yes. You're absolutely right, what, I, what you said. And then also, the, uh, earlier you talked about the competition. Yeah, I mean, because we're always in this intensive like uh, art form. Absolutely. And I, with the, the age, we grow in age, and then uh, the body probably not recover as fast, and not at, can be too active as before. But what you can do is you don't compete with young, don't compete with the others. They are individual, they are different. Mm. And what you can compete is yourself. Absolutely, 100%. Such a pleasure, Yuan Yuan, Thank to you. have you here. I'm so glad program. to be here. Thank my you honor. so much. All the best, my dear. Thank you very <laughs> much. Women are said to hold up half the sky. And they pull their own weight around the world, making their mark in their chosen fields. Jian Wei gets up close with all these women on top. Get to know how they do it all. Tune in to World Insight. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us. World Insight CGTN into your search engine. Or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.